Aloha guys, it's Joe Tunney, and we're here on an absolutely perfect day on the big island of Hawaii. So Ferdinand Porsche, he's the person who created Porsche. He started the company back in the 1930s, and that's important to know. A little bit of the history is, goes a long way to explaining the psychology that drives some of the choices people make with Porsche. Uh, Porsche was tasked with coming out with a car, uh, a vehicle for the common folk, so to speak, or wagon Volks, they called it Volkswagen, or uh, people's car. It came out in, uh, in the mid-30s for the German government. It was the Volkswagen Beetle. His first car was one of the most successful platforms in the history of the automobile industry. He went to prison for 20 months after World War II for war crimes, and when he got out, he started work with his son, Ferry Porsche, on a new sports car based off of that platform, which ultimately became the 356. And then in the mid-60s, they evolved that into the 911. The reason that that's such a big deal is that rear engine, rear wheel drive, open front uh, hood area where the trunk is in the front, where all the weight's in the back, but the, the cargo space is in the front, is fundamental to Porsche's history. To this very day, all 911s are still rear engine, rear wheel drive. And then the evolution of that, the Boxster Cayman platform, they are mid engine rear wheel drive, but very similar to their 911 counterparts. In 1995, that's the last generation of the air-cooled Porsche. So a great many people think that is the absolute zenith of the brand. From 1995 to 1998, that would be the 993 platform. We had a 993 for a couple of years, and I can absolutely testify it's one of the great cars that we've ever owned in our entire lives. But after the 993 came out, they had the 996. The 996 came out in 1999, and you'll see the 996 all the way up until 2004. The 996 is absolutely different than the 993. It's the most different uh, succeeding generation in the history of Porsche. The main thing is that it is no longer an air-cooled engine. It is a water-cooled engine. And so for several years, a lot of people kind of poo-pooed that car as if it weren't quote-unquote a real Porsche. And although prices are climbing up these days, I think your best deal on a 911 is the 996 platform. It is an absolutely phenomenal and underappreciated car, which is two things that you really want when you're looking for your next car. But there is something you need to know about 911s of this generation. We're going to take a look back and show you what it is. Now, all gas-powered engines have a couple of things, a crankshaft and a camshaft, and they work together. They're what makes sure that the gas and fuel, uh, the fuel-air mixture and the piston are doing the right thing at the right time. If the piston were to go up and the camshaft and the crankshaft weren't working together and there was no fuel-air there, well, that would be bad. If the piston was coming down and then all the fuel and air was dumping in at that moment, that would be bad. So it's critical that the crankshaft and the camshaft are doing exactly the same thing at exactly the same time. I can't think of a single car that does it differently except for the Porsche 996. It uses a third thing, an intermediate shaft or an IMS. And you'll hear that term IMS come up about a million times, especially if you're looking at any Porsche between about 2000 and 2008. Not just the 911s, but the Boxsters as well. The intermediate shaft, when it first came out, had multiple bearings attached to it. And that was fine. You don't hear too many problems with that. But they changed that in 2000 to a single ball bearing design that couldn't handle the loads of the engine and they broke. And when they break, what happens is, is that the entire engine comes undone. It scrapes off all kinds of metal shavings and fills your crankcase with just abundant metal. Your engine is gone. It's a $20,000 problem. So you hear a lot of negative things said about the 911 of this particular generation. I look at it like tires or brakes. If your tires are bald and have holes in them and you're driving at 100 miles an hour, something bad's gonna happen, unless you simply change your tires. 
if your brakes are metal on metal and you're driving down the road at 100 miles an hour, something bad's gonna happen. So just change your brakes. Same with the IMS. It's just another thing that can be serviced. I don't know why people make such a big deal out of it. Just replace it. It's not that expensive of a thing to do. So if I'm buying a 911, especially a 996, and more especially any 996 or 997 between 2000 and about 2005, 2006, for absolute certain, I am gonna replace the IMS, unless I have a receipt in my hand that says it was done and I trust the mechanic that did it. In fact, part of buying a Porsche is the experience of owning a Porsche. Why do it on the cheap? It takes all the fun out of it if you buy a Porsche and it only has, say, 40% left on its brake pads. You're thinking about it all the time. Oh, I'm gonna have to replace my brake pads in a couple of months or a few months. I hear a squeak, I wonder if they're going bad. Just put new pads on it. If you're buying one of these, put new tires on it as well. In fact, put a new IMS bearing in it as well, or an intermediate shaft, uh, put the whole shaft in, it's not that big of a deal. And so do all three. All three together are gonna cost you about five grand, but they're gonna put a giant smile on your face because it's like driving a brand new car. One great thing about Porsches is that not only are they easy on the eyes, they're very easy to drive. Now, the Boxster came out in 1997. The Porsche 996 came out in 1999. In 2000, the Boxster went through a pretty significant revision. 97 Boxsters are pretty darn cool, but 2000 Boxsters are really, really cool, and they share the exact same front end. In fact, two-thirds forwards of the Boxster in 2000 are pretty much identical to the 911 or the 996 of that generation. A little less power than you have in the 996, but still a fantastic car. Well, that was a problem for a lot of Porsche owners because you could hardly tell the difference between the more expensive 911 and the less expensive Boxster. So in 2002, the Porsche 911 went from what's called the bug eye headlight to the fried egg headlight. Why they call it the fried egg headlight, I don't know, but that's what they call it. And so 2002 and newer models have this more distinctive headlight treatment. Now, taking a look in front, this has been the Porsche emblem forever and ever. And so the backdrop on this is for the state of Württemberg in Germany. And then this part in the middle, this small medallion of a horse, that is for Stuttgart. And Stuttgart is where Porsches have been made since the very beginning. So this is your trunk in a Porsche, whether you get a Boxster, a Cayman, or a 911 series car, this is where you store your stuff. Now they all have hatches, so to speak, in the back, not true hatchbacks in the case of most 911s, although this one is a Targa, so it does have a hatchback. So there's extra space in the back as well. Let's take a look. One thing you're gonna discover about all Porsches, and this goes all the way back to the 80s, they're pretty darn small, but they have huge amounts of headroom and they're fit for bigger drivers. And so I'm six feet tall, about 180 pounds. And so if I was 6'3", six, 6'4", six, and I weighed 250 pounds or more than 250 pounds, I would actually be very comfortable. And that's a big deal because most small high performance cars just don't have that kind of space inside where you can feel absolutely comfortable. Another big deal is if you not, aren't six feet tall, say you're five six or six two or whatever it is that you are, you can make the seats move up and down as well, which changes your sight lines through the windshield. That's a big plus for getting comfortable when you drive fast. Now, you look at a car like this and you go, oh, it's a 2002, or excuse me, in the case of this one, it's a 2003, and it's a Tiptronic, so it can't be that fast. Believe it or not, this car has a top speed of over 170 miles an hour, as well as zero to 60 times below five seconds. And so it is plenty powerful. That's not necessarily why people buy this car. They buy this car because it's probably the single best handling for an all-around car, car that there is. They drive completely differently than other cars do, plus they just feel fantastic. You drive a car like this, as we are today here in Waikoloa, Hawaii, and you realize that this turns heads 
everywhere you go. So I mentioned that this particular car is a target top. And it is a target top and you don't see them all that often. Why? Well, because they cost a lot of money to make, but they do things that the other cars can't do. First off, it's a true hatchback. It's the only 911 in the series that is a hatchback, and that gives you just a little bit more space in the back, especially with the seats flopped down, than the other cars are going to do. The other thing is, is that the roof itself is 16.6 .6 cubic feet, or 16.6 .6 square feet, excuse me. And so the 16.6 .6 square foot panel actually retracts back into the hatch. We'll show you how that works. It is a true convertible experience, but it actually has reinforced structural piping throughout that makes the car architecturally quite strong. In fact, as far as structural rigidity, it's virtually identical to the coupe. That's a big deal when you're getting to 15 and plus years gone by that the cars want to collapse in, so to speak, and they can squeak and rattle where this one doesn't at all. Now I get it, this one has super duper low miles and is in absolutely phenomenal condition. However, any Targa is gonna be structurally quite strong. Torsionally, they're in between the convertible and the coupe, and so they still handle extremely well. The, the top itself, the Targa top, is installed by CTS. They actually bring the top in and install it going up from bottom to top. It's kind of the opposite of what you would think. But by doing it that way, they protect the weather sealing in this. And even a car like this that's plus 15 years old doesn't leak one drop. Now you can see, even with the Targa top open in this 2003 996 Targa, the sound isn't all that bad. You can hear the air rushing by, but it doesn't circulate inside the car, which makes it very comfortable to have a conversation inside without losing the performance capacity of what this car is designed for. in the five to fifteen or twenty thousand dollar price range a 911 the generation that we're talking about is between the twenty to one hundred thousand dollar range or something like this came in GTS came in GTS uh, fully loaded is a little over ninety thousand dollars but I'm buying a used Porsche there's things I need to know the IMS bearing that's gonna come up whether you get 911s or Boxsters cooling systems, suspension systems, tires. Almost every Porsche you're going to look at has offset tires. Bigger in the back, smaller in the front. Unusual tire sizes that they don't keep in stock at your local Costco. Brakes. Everything from expensive performance brakes to ceramic brakes. You just have to get a buyer's inspection. I say that about every single car in the whole wide world, that you always get a buyer's inspection at the brand that sells it new. There's only one car in the world that I don't say that about, and that is the Porsche, particularly 911s, Boxsters, and Caymans. The reason is, is that this modern generation of Porsches is different than a lot of the older Porsches. Wherever you live, I'm from Seattle, there's somebody who's considered the guru of Porsches. For us in downtown Seattle, it was Dr. John Walker for years and years. In the east side in Bellevue, it was Squire Thomasy. Everybody in the Porsche world knows who these folks are. They are like the holy shaman of Porsches, particularly 911s, Boxsters, and Caymans. They simply know things that a modern technician probably doesn't. 
I went to Squire Thomasy once in Bellevue because we had a front end problem with a car that had some kind of electrical snafu to it. We had done everything, pulled the dashboard out, gone through everything that we could think of and we couldn't figure it out. I pull up to his store one day and I explain the situation. The guy goes behind the front seats and rips out the carpets like a madman. I'm looking at him like, what in the heck is this guy doing? He points at this wire and he says, see, there's your problem right there. I'm not kidding. He had that thing sorted out in about 15 seconds and it was in a totally different part of the car. That kind of experience and that kind of knowledge is critical when you're buying an expensive, older, exotic car. I can't recommend enough before you buy your next 911, Boxster, or Cayman. Find out who your guru is in your town. Find that one person who's the absolute master of all things Porsche. Let them do the buyer's inspection before you pay one penny towards the purchase of your next Porsche and never let anybody touch your car again except for that one person. If it costs a couple of bucks extra, let me tell you something, it is absolutely worth it. Not only do you need to buy the best one, you need to service it to keep it in tip top shape. But if you do, you will understand why Porsche people are such fanatics about their cars. You could drive the least expensive 911 in the world and drive down the road and somebody driving a $100,000 Porsche will wave by you as they go by saying, good job, way to keep the tradition alive. It's no different than if you have the cheapest little motorcycle in the whole wide world and you pass by the toughest guys in town, a dozen of them on their big Harleys. They'll still wave even though your bike stinks compared to theirs because it's cool that you're keeping the tradition alive. And you'll understand why that's a big deal when you get behind the wheel of your next new Porsche.